Dig your hand in the land. We're gonna have a meeting, everybody. Hi, I'm Janet Cubitt, bringing you this week's edition of In the Tractor Seat. Brought to you by Minnesota Farmers Union in partnership with Farmers Union Agency, its wholly owned subsidiary. Risk Management Supervisor and Senior Risk Consultant Nate Drugsma of Secure Insurance is in the tractor seat this week. Nate Drugsma earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry from Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter, Minnesota. Upon completion of a risk management development program, Nate worked as a risk consultant in Minnesota and North Dakota for nearly seven years. He joined Sakira in August 2013 as a risk management consultant. Nate took on the dual role of supervisor, senior risk consultant in January 2017. He is a certified safety professional and has earned his associate in risk management certification. Nate lives in Elk River, Minnesota with his wife and two daughters. Thank you, Nate, for joining us today. Thanks, Janet. Uh, yeah, like, like Janet had said, uh, Minnesota, born and raised uh, just outside of, of Minneapolis up in Elk River, and then went to school down in, in St. Peter and at Federated for seven years, so down in Owatonna. And then first territory was up in Fergus Falls, so lived in the northwest portion of the state for about 10 months, and then had the opportunity to move back down here to, to the cities, more of the metro area, to my hometown, so been here the past 14 years, I suppose now, somewhere in there. So uh, kind of taking me around most of the parts of the state. Uh, kind of just to give you a little idea here before I share my screen on how Secura Insurance handles the risk management side of things. We currently have four consultants in the state, myself plus three others, and we're pretty well spread out kind of covering the different sections of the state. So we have one gentleman, Michael Haugen, down just east of Rochester and St. Charles. He kind of covers the, the bottom third of the state. Uh, Mark Haganis is a gentleman up here in the Plymouth area, and he handles the, the middle band of, of the state. And then Andrea Dobler is our consultant based out of, she's up kind of Staples Motley area, and she sort of handles the northern, northwest portion in North Dakota for us as well now. And then for me personally, uh, did a lot of farm back in the day. My dad grew up on a dairy farm. My, mom, my mom's parents owned egg produce in Pease, Minnesota. So have a little agricultural background, but with the supervisor role, my territory now is pretty much Hennepin County and Sherburne County. So there's still some farms out there, but not like we would see in some of the old territories that I had. So uh, that's just a little background kind of what Secura has from a consultant standpoint. And then we will share before, our screen. Before you continue, Nate, we wanted to do a little bit. I was going to tell the audience about welcoming them to submit their questions via the chat, and those will be answered later in the program. Take it away. Perfect. Thanks, Janet. Yeah, you know, and, and as well, if there's something while I'm talking and something comes in, Janet, that's relevant to what we're talking about, feel free to interrupt and we can catch those right at it as well. Otherwise, we'll, we'll grab them at the end. Um, so kind of what our, our topic today, again, farm risk management, Nate Drugs, a senior risk management consultant with Secura Insurance, uh, for those of you that aren't overly familiar with Secura, we write all lines and then we have our commercial branch, personal lines, uh, farm and egg business. And then we also have a specialty side that handles kind of your, your harder risks that don't really fall into that commercial or farm egg base. So like a YMCA, your, your local community has a parade or a, you know, a happy days event or something. Those are the other types of things specialty insures. So uh, is it showing up, Janet? Did it pop it up? We're good? Okay. Looks good on my screen. Okay, there we go. Advanced. So the agenda for today, three things that we wanted to touch on. Uh, first and foremost, grain bin safety. Uh, getting into that time of year again where we're going to be filling some of these things up. Maybe we're offloading them to make room for the, the new harvest. So we wanted to touch on some grain bin safety, a very big exposure for a lot of our farms out there. Um, and one of, those, one of those types of exposure where the frequency isn't very high, but the severity is, is very high. Um, so it's one of those things we always wanna make sure we, we touch on because there aren't too many incidences of grain bin engulfments that end in anything other than a fatality or very serious injury. Uh, second is just touch a real quick on six points to keep in mind for our harvest exposures. 
And then finally, we just want to touch real short, uh, just kind of give some resources and let you know what's out there from a mental health resource standpoint. Um, you know, farming and agricultural businesses, it, it takes a it takes a toll on you from a mental health standpoint. So we just want to make sure you're aware of some resources that are out there. So, so this part I, I chose here, I'd seen a few half a million bushel grain bins built on some of the farms I've visited. I've never seen one this size. This is apparently the largest grain bin GSI has made to date uh, from a diameter standpoint, 156 foot diameter. So pretty much from goal line to 50 yard line diameter on this thing and 1.38 million bushels of corn. So you could put about 8,000 acres you know, with an average typical yield of corn into that one single grain bin. So just, just amazing some of the things that they're building out there now from a, a grain bin standpoint. And this one's actually down in, in Red Wing, Minnesota, if you want to take a road trip and see it for yourself. So a couple things on grain bin safety. Why are we looking at this? What are the statistics on it? Well, on average, about two dozen people are killed each year in grain entrapment, entrapment incidences. Uh, the thing with, you know, the entrapments and the engulfments in, in grain bins is, you know, they usually, when you talk to fire personnel and the emergency responders, they usually talk about these things as recoveries, not uh, rescues. Because by the time they get out there, typically it's it's no longer uh, worth, it, no longer possible to save a life. It's just trying to recover that body from inside the grain bin. A person buried to the waist in grain requires a force equivalent to their own weight plus about 600 pounds to free them. And uh, that's just if you're up to your waist, if you're fully engulfed, an extra 2,000 pounds. Uh, that might not mean anything to you if you don't have a physics or a, a math background, uh, but all you need to take away from that bullet point is you're not gonna be able to just pull somebody out with your own strength. That person's not gonna be able to pull themselves out by crawling out or by pulling themselves up on other grain or pulling on a rope. You're gonna need some mechanical support of some sort to get somebody out once they've been fully engulfed inside that grain bin. And then the other thing to really keep in mind that's important is 80% of all reported engulfments involve a person inside a bin when grain unloading equipment is running. So it's that movement of the grain, the shifting, the funneling to the middle to get out through the, through the exit in the bottom. That's what causes the, the downward movement and the, the quicksand effect of that grain. So you know, being smart about locking those things out if somebody's going inside the grain bin and, and being aware of when it's gonna be turned on and when it's gonna be running. So how do engulfments occur? Where are three main areas of concern when we're talking grain bins and grain bin safety? Uh, important thing to take away here is if we know how these things occur, then we can start figuring out ways to stop them from happening. Uh, you know, if you don't know how the problem creates itself, then you're never going to be able to find the right controls for it. So here's our three most common ways that engulfments occur uh, in order, I would say, of how often they happen as well. Number one, standing on moving or flowing grain can shift like quicksand, burying you in seconds. Uh, you kind of see the picture of the guy, you know, they never find somebody on the outside wall of a grain bin. Uh, reason being, all that corn funnels like a cyclone to the middle where it's being ejected out the bottom. And so that's where it kind of pulls you down and in into the grain there. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people think, well, if I feel it shifting, I'll just quick run to the outside wall and hang on. A couple numbers to keep in mind. Two to three seconds usually is all it takes to react to something like this once that, once that, uh, the auger's turned on in the bottom. How long to be trapped? So in other words, you're deep enough now in that corn where you're not just gonna be able to step out of it is about four to five seconds. And then how long till you're completely covered is usually anywhere between 20 and 22 seconds. Um, so this isn't that type of thing where you're gonna have some time to sit and think about how you're gonna rescue yourself, how you're gonna get out of this. Um, once it starts, you better just hope that uh, there's somebody else around that can, can help stop that auger and, and hopefully be able to try to keep your head above, keep your chest above. Because um, what really ends up happening in these situations is as people get sucked further under, the weight of the grain on the body compresses your chest. You're no longer allowed to get breaths. As you fight for more breaths, you end up just taking in the grain and then you end up suffocating from not being able to breathe is, is really what ends up happening to most of these people. So number two, moisture or mold can cause grain to clump and form a crust or a bridge on the surface of a grain pile. 
And as the grain is unloaded, an empty space can form under the bridge and then collapse if you attempt to cross it. Uh, I'm sure if you've been farming long enough, everybody's had this happen once or twice. Um, so we just need to be, be aware that there can be those voids under there. What you think you see isn't always what's there. Um, so using a long pole from the top to try to break those things up versus going out there and walking on it. And then the third one, grain that is accumulated on the side of a bin can unexpectedly collapse. So you're getting down to that point where you feel it's safe to hop in there and start scraping some of that corn or any type of grain that's kind of collected on the side um, and not realizing that there's still quite a bit of force and a lot of weight that can fall down and, and trap that employee. Other area where we see a lot of this is, and it's a point of emphasis for OSHA is any type of excavation work. Same type of thing, you know, that cave in from the side, you know, you have all that weight of that corn on you and, and you're just not going to be able to get out of that from yourself. So being smart and, and understanding where your exit points are and, and uh, having something that can keep you further, far enough away from that, that, that side that's built up so that if it does come down all in one, it's not going to engulf you and collapse on top of you. So those are your three main, main common ways engulfments in grain bins occur. So some safety precautions. You can see on the right there, the, the picture that I threw up, uh, not sure how many uh, uh, people are really using this with the exception of maybe some of your larger corporate farms, uh, but really the safest, best way to ever enter a grain bin. And this is really similar to what you'll see in general industry from a confined space standpoint is making sure that you have a harness, you got your lifeline, you got the pulley on the top, and then you have that person that's uh, manning it and you can kind of, it's tough to see, but that, that enlarged picture kind of shows how that would be tied off. And then they have the, the belay device that they would have there. So that, and as you go down, that person can kind of hold you at that height and you're sort of locked in. So if the grain were to start sliding out from under you, you start going in, you're basically locked into place. You're not gonna fall down. You're not gonna get engulfed. And then they can use the, the mechanical pulley system to be able to help pull you up if need be. Uh, but the goal is to not get engulfed. You know, if you're buried knee deep, but you can't go any deeper, that's considered a win. You know, it's a lot better than the alternative. So that just kind of gives you an idea there. But some other safety precautions, managing grain to prevent the spoilage. Uh, you know, that's first and foremost. You don't get the crust. You don't get uh, uh, some of those danger areas in there. So making sure we're running our fans, checking our moisture levels, kind of knowing what we have going in there. Working from outside the bin, if at all possible, like I mentioned earlier, knocking that crust on top away if you think you have it with a long pole uh, instead of getting in there yourself with a shovel and walking on top of that thing. Providing proper training for all the employees. So anybody, nobody should ever get in a grain bin without having proper training as far as what the hazards are associated with it, whether it be a, from a dust standpoint, if they're going in to clean it out, what do I need to know, where are my hazards? Um, they should always have some sort of training. It should never just be, hey, you're the new guy, go do the grunt work inside the grain bin. Uh, that's not how we're going to do this thing in a safe manner. And then having a plan for entering a grain bin. That's where we start getting into what are we going to be using for tools? What type of lifeline do we have? Are we wearing harnesses? You know, how are we going to attack this problem? And grainsafety.org is where I got this particular picture from. Um, they have some really good information. And then the University of Minnesota Farm Extension, their Extension Farm Safety Program is just a phenomenal resource if you're looking for some other things out there on, on any aspect of, of farming life in Minnesota. So a lot of really good pieces there. A couple of things from the harvest exposures. And these ones actually come from, from Iowa State, but we're getting into that time of year. Uh, six tips, just some, some best practices, some things to keep in mind to try to keep a safe harvest. Uh, the interesting thing about this, when I think of it from a secure standpoint, from a large loss standpoint, uh, we're always thinking combines, combine fires out in the field. So interesting enough, really nothing from Iowa State talks really about blowing down your equipment and, you know, making sure we're cleaning out our, any jams that take place. Uh, but, you know, that's always important as well to make sure we're maintaining these things throughout harvest as well, uh, not just running up. And I know you got to get the you got to get the crop out of the field, but you know, it doesn't do you any good if you have a $300,000 combine burning in the middle of it. So uh, making sure we're being safe there. But a couple tips. 
Keep safety features, mirrors, and windows clean both in and out of the field. Uh, you know, sometimes easier said than done, but you know, rather than just continuing along when you can't see out those side mirrors, making sure we're cleaning them off. Inspecting your PTO safety shields, especially for those farms that fall under OSHA's jurisdiction. So if they got their employees out there, uh, you know, making sure a PTO shield on there is the responsibility of, of the business owner. So whether it came with it or not, it's still your responsibility. Look out for stray metal and other debris while you're harvesting. Um, obviously the, the damage it can do to your equipment, but then also what it does to the, you know, to the crop that you're providing. Being aware of your crew's location. This probably sounds like a pretty obvious thing, but you'd be amazed how many people get hit by tractors and combines and um, different pieces of equipment, uh, skid steers especially. So making sure your backup alarms work if they have them. Um, the honking horns when you're gonna get ready to start moving, just so everybody around is aware that, hey, this piece of equipment, this machinery is, is now gonna be on the move. So let's pay attention here. Checking your tow ropes and, and chains when extracting stuck equipment. Uh, making sure those things are in good shape before you have to use them rather than getting to the point where, okay, now I got this piece of equipment, this piece of machinery is stuck. I got to tow it out. All I have is a bad tow stroke, bad tow rope or some chinked chains. All right, well, I need this thing to get my crop out of the ground, so I'm going to use it anyways. So checking beforehand to make sure these things are in good shape. And then being conscious of your mental health and seeking help when necessary. It's a, a, a crazy stressful time, especially if yields aren't real great. It's been a tough, tough year growing season in a lot of parts of the state from a moisture standpoint. Um, so just being aware and, and taking that time to, to seek that help when necessary. And that sort of ties in our, our last slide here as we talk about mental health resources and really kind of the lack of those resources in our upstate areas, in those rural areas. Uh, as recently as 2017, rural areas in Minnesota had one licensed mental health provider for every about 2,000 residents. You come to the metro area, the seven county metro area, and you have one in every 340. Um, I'd be willing to argue just due to the, the stressful nature of some of the, the, uh, the, the types of work, especially farming, the ag side of things with the long hours of existing, exhausting physical work. And then obviously the financial uncertainty that comes with farming. Um, and quite often, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a pretty alone type of work that you're doing a lot of times on the farm. You know, long hours on the tractor and the combine, feeding the animals, whatever it might be. And it's very, very solitary a lot of times, which can just all add on to that stress. So a few of the areas where you can find some good resources on this, uh, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture has some really good resources, uh, including the Minnesota Farm and Rural Helpline, uh, the Minnesota Rural Mental Health Specialist, which is actually two individuals where their, their sole responsibility, one handles the northern part of the state, one handles the southern part of the state, and they can come out and help with any type of mental health uh, issue that's arising and help put in plans in place and just kind of get you those resources uh, that you might need uh, to deal with some of this. And then they have mobile crisis teams as well that deal with more than just uh, more than just your mental health. It can be any type of stress that's caused on the farm, uh, you know, helping put plans in place and, and dealing with some of those things. So a really, really nice resources on the Minnesota Department of Agriculture from what they have. And you can kind of see the links on the bottom there. Uh, but uh, the Minnesota Farm Stress, Coping with Stress link on the Department of Agriculture website is where you can go to find all the numbers, the contact information, uh, whatever you might need if this is you know, a really stressful time um, for any of the folks that you either insure and work with or for any, any farmers that happen to be on the, on the webinar right now as well. So those are out there and they are available. and and uh, worth, worth using, very worth, worth using. So with that being said, that's kind of the, what I had prepared. Any questions come in while we were talking there, Janet? Well, we did, we did get a question, Nate, and thank you for mentioning those resources. I, did, did you happen to attend the um, Minnesota Department of Ag when they put on those information sessions for training people about recognizing 
these signs in some of their customers, some of their clients about mental health challenges? I, I, I didn't. I, it would be good if they, if it's somewhere out there, I'd love to watch it. But, you know, a lot of it too is, you know, there still is a stigma around mental health and people being willing to speak up for others. Uh, you know, I've, I know I've experienced it in my life where you know, rarely does anything happen where at the end, everybody, everybody says they never expected anything, but then when you're really serious with yourself and you sit down you're like, you know what, I, I did notice some things, but people just aren't a lot of times don't want to bring it up, you know, because yep. of the stigma. Um, so yeah, being willing to speak up for yourself or for others. Uh, you know, I know, I know the couple of times I have, you know, one particular friend of mine, they appreciated it after the fact you know, maybe didn't at the time, but they appreciated it after the fact, so. And that was one of the things that they talked about in that, in that presentation is speaking up for others and asking questions. But yep. the question that came, we had a questions that came in, one that we had was about the earlier slide where you showed the crust. If you could go back to that and talk more about, yeah, how the, how the crust form and, you know, what causes them to form and then just what are, what are some things that you can do as prevention, some additional prevention for that? Yeah. Yep. So primarily where, you know, it's the moisture in the mold, you know, is, is where that comes from. So if the rain went in real wet, maybe it wasn't dried as much as it should have been, or if the fans that are on the grain bin, maybe they're not, they're not maintained well enough or they're not run long enough or properly. Uh, you know, whatever it might be, if there doesn't get good airflow in there, it's, it's not as much as the advancements in the technology of grain bins has advanced. It's still really kind of an art to being able to get that good moisture level all the way through. Um, since obviously your, your grain further down is going to lose its moisture first, and then you need to keep kind of moving up and, and doing that. So that's really where it comes from. You get wet corn, wet grain of any sort in there and then if it doesn't get dried out it kind of clumps together and it hardens and just turns into that crust so uh, you know for a lot of the ones I've seen the presentations I've seen you know it, it's not a real bit you know it's not like a six foot area is all encrusted it's just the, the top because that's the part that's still getting some open air and and allowing those things to to uh, kind of harden and get like it is so really, if you're not going to have, if you're not going to break it up while using a harness and a lifeline system, then really the only safe way to do it is a good long metal pole, where if you can get the, the door on top and you can break that up while, it, while it's going. Um, you know, for a lot of people, they probably don't even realize it's, unless you're watching and you kind of have an idea of how much grain you started with, and you've pulled out, you know, however many bushels and truckloads, but then you look in and you're, you, it hasn't dropped at all. That's probably a pretty good sign that you've got that crust building up and, and uh, you know, some things got spoiled up there. And that's where instead of jumping in, that's where a good long metal pole to try break it up, uh, you know, something like that is, is the recommended way. Or, I mean, you know, lifeline works as well, but you need to make sure you know what you're doing when you're using something like that. And so many times farmers work alone. They shouldn't work alone around grain bins, should they? Not if they're getting into it. Uh, yeah, if you're going in, you know, and that's, you know, that kind of gets back to some of your OSHA standards too, when you're talking a confined space. So basically any type of space that's not made for human habitation, only has one means of entrance or exit, and, you know, kind of a smaller space like that, that may have poor air in it as well, uh, you need to have of basically a rescue plan in place before you ever even enter that. Uh, you know, in, in regular general commercial areas, they would make you test the air quality before you ever get in there. So that's another thing I didn't, I didn't mention it before, but uh, you know, you can get some methane gas, some different things kind of building up inside there. If it's a real tight, real tight uh, grain bin, or if the air hasn't been flowing for a while. So probably not a bad idea to air that thing out for a while before you ever get in it. Or if you have an air meter tester or something, you know, just run that in there to make sure you're not jumping into a space that's, that shouldn't be habited by, by people, you know, because then it's a same type of thing. You get knocked out from the gases in there and now it's a rescue operation or a recovery operation. Uh, you'll see that 
don't see it a ton in grain bins, but you see it a fair amount. And there was just a story a few months ago, I think it was in Wisconsin or maybe it was Minnesota, but it was, uh, I think it was a, a dad and maybe one of his kids that got stuck in their manure pit. Yeah, that was underneath. Wisconsin. Yeah. And how they ever got out alive, I have no idea. But that's usually what you see happen is somebody gets in there, the gas has knocked them out, and then they don't have any type of lifeline or any way of retrieving them. So the kid runs out there and sees his dad. So the first thing he does is jump in the pit too. And now you're recovering two bodies in, instead of one. So uh, yeah, knowing the atmosphere you're jumping into there is, is very important. Are there tests out there available that you can use for ambient air testing? It, I mean, there's, there's meters that you can buy. That's typically, there's little different badges that you can find as well that'll change color if the air oxygen levels get below a certain level or if certain gases are, are there. But what most of the places that do it on a regular basis, they'll, they'll actually have little air meters, air monitors attached right to their equipment that you know, they can test the air before they ever get it. And usually test for like six or seven different things, you know, any, any type of, well, first and foremost, lack of oxygen but then also, you know, high levels of certain, certain types of air, certain things that are, they know are hazardous, um, you know, so that's really the thing too, is knowing what could potentially be in there. And then you want to test for that because, you know, there's a lot of things that, a lot of things that aren't good for you and that are dangerous from an air quality standpoint, but they're just not going to be present in a grain bin. So there's no reason to test for those types of things. Yeah. Well, another question I have was about, <laughs> combine fires. This is also our combine fire season. Do mm -hmm. you have any advice on how do you prevent combine tractor fires this time of year? You know, most of the fires we see usually occur while they're driving around, you know, while they're harvesting. You know, so it's, and it, it, it usually doesn't happen on the first day or the second day of harvest. So it's making sure we're, we're doing our preventative maintenance while we're doing our heart, you know, start in a good place. But then we need to be blowing those machines down on a fairly regular basis, getting rid of that thatch and the dry, dry stuff inside there. And then, you know, making sure you have good working fire extinguishers in your combine as well. Uh, you know, a lot of them, ones that we see and we'll read the, the loss report, the farmer in, the, in the, the cab saw the smoke, knew there was a fire starting, but they didn't have a working fire extinguisher in the cab with them or outside by where they would open up the, the combine to be able to put that thing out. And so what started is just a slow smoldering inside there ended up eventually getting to that critical point where it really ignited and, and started up. And at that point, you're in the middle of a 2000 acre field. <laughs> 15 miles from the nearest volunteer fire department, you can say goodbye to that combine, you know, or that picker. It's, it's not coming back. So, you know, those are the biggest things, making sure we're blowing those things out on a regular basis, keeping them clean, and then having a good working fire extinguisher of a size that's actually going to do something. You know, I'll see that from side, time to time too. You'll have just the little kind that somebody would keep underneath their sink that can just just barely blow out a candle. And then they expect that to be able to do something on a, you know, a smoldering combine. Uh, so making sure you have a big enough fire extinguisher that's actually able to blow for a couple seconds and, and hopefully- I know, I know what I'm gonna get, get to my, my husband farmer, yeah. some, uh, <laughs> fi a fire extinguisher this fall. And I believe that's all the time we have. For, we have one more. Do you have any um, flyers or any other marketing materials that can be sent to customers with tips on farm safety, or perhaps even this, we'll be, we'll be putting this presentation online afterward, but is there any other tips that you, any yeah, other so you, flyers that you have? We don't, at this point, we're working on creating some more kind of the hard copy type flyers you can bring out to, to the different farmers. But for right now, you can go to our secura.net, our secura website, and there'll be a banner towards the bottom right side of the main page that says risk management resources. And if you go into there, you can search our resource log for different farm and ag. There are a lot of blog posts, but it's the same type of thing. So there's probably one up now for harvest season. Uh, you know, there's other ones for winter storage, uh, you know, whatever it might be a lot. Of, so a lot of different 
safety topics related to the farm and ag industry. And those can easily be printed off and, and brought out and, you know, given to somebody. They can, I believe you can email them if you get in contact with some of your insureds that way. So, yeah, so that's the best way to go out and get our resources right now. Um, and then also if there is something specific for one of your farms that's insured with Secura. And so maybe they, you know, they have a pretty decent fleet of vehicles or, you know, they're looking for some help putting together a basic safety program. They can go on our website and, and request, there'll be a spot on the left side of that risk management resources where you can submit just a quick fill out a form with what you're looking for from a safety standpoint. And then we can get a consultant in touch with you and kind of help build that out for them. So that's the best best place now for resources. Well, thank you, Nate, and thank you, everyone. We are at the end of our time for today. Again, Nate Drugsma is a senior risk consultant with Secure Insurance, a premier partner of Farmers Union Agency, which is a full service agency fully owned by Minnesota Farmers Union. Thank you, everyone, and join us next Tuesday when we'll be featuring Kathy Zeman, Executive Director of Minnesota Farmers Market Association and owner of Simple Harvest Farm Organics near Near Strand. She's gonna talk about the state's 346 farmers markets and how the weather this year impacted the product producers who bring the products to those farmers markets. Learn more about Minnesota Farmers Union and become a member at mfu.org. Learn more about Farmers Union Agency at fuainsurance.com. Dig your hand in the land we're going.